Und ich freue mich sehr auf äh, Jen Zhao. Nicht nur äh, auf seine Thesen, sondern eben auch, weil er wahrscheinlich aus, er, er kommt, er, er kommt aus Asien, er hat eine etwas andere Betrachtungsweise und darauf bin ich sehr gespannt. Jen Zhao trat 2015 als Co-Direktor für Global Marco Research bei Brandywine Global ein und leitet den proprietären globalen makroökonomischen Forschungsprozess. Seine führende Position in der Gestaltung makroökonomischer Forschung hat außerdem zu einer erfolgreichen Laufbahn als hervorragender Vorausdenker in der Branche geführt. Von 1992 bis 2015 war Jen Chefredakteur und Chief Global Strategist der BCA Group, wo er den Unternehmensbereich globales Anlageresearch und Strategie leitete. Vor seiner Tätigkeit bei BCA war Chen Zhao Professor an der Pekinger Zentraluniversität für Finanzen und Wirtschaft und außerdem leitender Berater mehrerer Regierungsorganisationen in der Volksrepublik China. Chens Erfahrung in chinesischer Wissenschaft und Verwaltung von 82 bis 88 war auch integraler Bestandteil seines Erfolgs bei der Einführung der China Investment und Emerging Market Strategien während seiner Zeit bei BCA. Chen besitzt einen Master of Arts Abschluss vom Zentralinstitut für Finanzen und Bankwesen in Peking und er absolvierte Postgraduate-Studien an der McGill University und an der University of Illinois äh, in den Jahren 1988 bis 1992. So, Professor Zhao, I'm really looking forward to your presentation. Uh, please come on the floor. The floor is yours. <laughs> you. Forward. This is to show, this is back. Thank okay. you very much Thank for you. your... Uh, hey, one, one more. You have a, wir haben einen Fragebogen. Und der Veranstalter hat mich gebeten, dass Sie diesen Fragebogen ausfüllen, während den Ver Referaten und nachher. Wir, Sie wollen, dass man davon profitiert und letztendlich die nächste Tagung in einem Jahr noch besser macht. Also ich danke Ihnen schon heute jetzt für das Feedback. Now it's really yours, the floor. Thank you, Mr. Thank you very much. <laughs> Uh, thank you for your kind introduction, even though I have no idea what you said. Um, you know, I was a little bit limp. Uh, normally, I don't walk like that. I, that's a consequence of uh, heavy drinking last night. So when you drink too much, be careful for a gout attack. So that's what I'm suffering right now. Uh, my assignment is to talk about macro, uh, global economy, for the next 30 minutes. Um, before I start, I thought that I'm going to share you a story of an alcoholic man whose father is trying to persuade him to quit the bad habit. I think one day the father actually brought in two glasses with one glass of water, the other glass of vodka. And the dad basically dropped a worm into the glass of water. Of course, the worm was swimming around, was pretty happy, and then the father took out the worm and dropped it into the glass of vodka. Predictably, the worm went to the bottom and dead. So the dad asked the son, saying, son, what have you learned? The son said, well, I can drink vodka without worm. So the, uh, the story here is that actually, uh, we, by observing the same kind of uh, phenomenon, we can draw very different conclusions depending on what you believe. So today, what I'm gonna do is to, uh, to share with you my perception of the world economy, its main problem, and especially uh, what, the, what does that mean for financial markets. Um, it has been a very difficult period, uh, especially since the beginning of the year, actually, if you look at the asset returns. Uh, I think the S&P 500 is barely positive, probably uh, slightly negative. Um, most of the asset classes actually give you heartburn and, uh, you know, heart, you know, whatever you call that, it's pretty pathetic. Um, if you think about history, uh, the only period that is very similar to today is, in fact, the second half of the 90s. And that period is very important for today. Let me refresh your memory a little bit. You understand why the second half of the 90s is so important. Remember that in early 90s, the United States 
went through a savings and loan crisis, which is also a banking crisis, and a recession. After the savings and loan crisis, the U.S. economy had a three-year, very anemic economic recovery. Actually, the recovery was so weak, remember that George Bush Sr., the father, actually got booted out of the office. At the time, corporate downsizing, corporate outsourcing, that was the story. That was the headline story every day. Actually, until 93, especially in the latter part of 93, the world started to realize that actually the U.S. economy might got some traction. Okay? And then until the summer of 94, the Fed was ready to raise interest rates. Actually, in fact, in July of 94, the Fed, for the first time in a long time, started to raise interest rates. The interesting part here is not really the Fed raising rate. The interesting part is at the time when the Fed was raising rate, the Bundesbank and Bank of Japan were cutting them. So when you think about this policy divergence, that was the first time since the end of the Second World War that the major policy, major central banks around the world start to have policy, monetary policy, that are moving completely in a different path, whereas, Bank of, whereas the Federal Reserve at the time was clearly on the path of tightening monetary policy, whereas Bank of Japan and the Bundesbank were on the path of easing. So that is a very similar to today's background because, of course, if you look at the Federal Reserve, we got no interest rate to be cut, but the Fed has stopped quantitative easing for, for quite some time. At the same time, if you look at the rest of the world, from ECB to Bank of Japan to People's Bank of China, they were all easing. So you can see the policy divergence shaping up very similar to the second half of the 90s. Now, the even more interesting is, if you look at the financial market performance, it is even more interesting. Why? Recall what happened back then. Once we had this very diverging monetary policy, the first thing that actually happened, and I think it's very important, is that U.S. dollar took off. The U.S. dollar had a 50%, 55% rally from 95 all the way to 2000. The dollar went up 50% in trade-weighted terms. That was the biggest bull market since the end of the Second World War. Actually, it was bigger, even bigger than Plaza Accord. Okay? The second thing that happened, that you, you should remember that, that is very relevant to today, is that if you look at emerging markets and commodities, the emerging market were completely destroyed in the second half of the 90s. First was Thailand, Thai bot crisis, and then the Thai bot crisis spread into Korea, the entire Asia, and eventually it, it went to Russia, Brazil, Argentina. Entire emerging market went into crisis in the second half of the 90s. And of course, commodity got destroyed, okay? The third thing I think is very interesting, and it's very important even for today, is that by 95, the whole world came to a consensus that the U.S. bond yields got nowhere to go but up, for obvious reasons. The U.S. economy was recovering. The Fed was raising rate. It's no brainer that bond yields got to go up. The whole world got it wrong. Actually, if you look at 30-year yield, the 30-year yield dropped from 95 to 98 by 300 basis points. That was a massive rally in the U.S. bond market. Right now, we understand why. Because of the Asia into crisis, the Asian manufacturing have to liquidate their surplus product. The excessive saving from Asia actually moved into the U.S., drove down yields, drove up U.S. dollar. That was the reason. But at the time, I was, that came as a total surprise. Well, think about today. We're relieving that same experiment. We're relieving the same experience. 
Think about the uh, commodities. I mean, I don't have to say anything. It's, you know, anybody who bought commodities and held into, onto them, you basically, sorry, I have to say sorry. You know, it's very bad. The emerging market got destroyed. And if you think about bond market, early 2014, the world came to a consensus that 3% U.S. 10-year treasury got no value whatsoever. Everybody got it wrong. The bond yields actually <laughs> dropped to 1.8, and today is 2%. Okay? We are relieving that experience. Not only that, if you think about the U.S. dollar, the dollar gained 32%. So if you look at every asset class, it's very similar. The performance is exactly the same as what you would expect if you go back 20-some 20, 20 years. Now, the interesting part is this. So what? The dollar has already gained 32%. Tell me something about the future. You know, you know I, when I worked at BCA, you know, people say, well, it's, history is cheap. You can always sort of uh, overlay your story with history, but tell me what might happen going forward. Now, let me try. Let's make an attempt to tell you what might happen going forward. It could be wrong, but don't call me if I'm wrong. <laughs> Three observations. Number one, when you think about today's environment and compare it with 19, late, the second half of the 90s, the major difference here today is this. We have got very low nominal growth. Very low nominal growth. Let me give you some numbers. You know exactly what I'm talking about. If you look at the U.S. economy, nominal growth is 3.5%. Okay? If you look at the U.S. post-war history, every time the U.S. economy was in recession, that's the kind of nominal growth you would expect. Because every time you look at it from 80s, 90s, every time the U.S. economy got into recession, 2 to 3% nominal growth, that's what you're going to get. So today, we're not talking about recession. Uh, nonetheless, nominal growth is 3.5%. Let me show you this. You see here, the shaded area is recession. You can see that. We are growing at a level that is not far off from recession, number one. If you look at the Eurozone, Eurozone nominal growth is 2%. If you look at the post-war history, every time the Eurozone economy was in recession, you're talking about nominal GDP of 2.5%. So today's Eurozone nominal growth is even lower than the previous recession levels. Now, if you look at China, that's your chart on left-hand side. That's nominal GDP. People are saying, well, the Chinese government is lying by telling us it's 7%. I say, wait a minute. If growth is really 7%, the nominal number is really awful because they have deflator, GDP deflator, that is negative. So you can see that nominal GDP has been lowest since 1998. Okay? So in other words, we're dealing with an extraordinary situation where even though the real growth is half decent, but nominal growth are very close to global recession levels. It's very difficult to get your mind around. I mean, what exactly does that mean? I think it means a couple of things. Number one, if you're dealing with very low nominal growth, then your profit assumption has to be remake. In other words, the profit is a nominal concept. If you have a very low nominal growth, your profit, your corporate profit growth will have to converge to very low levels. Because you cannot sustainably grow your profit at a level that is higher than your nominal growth. Because if you keep doing that, then the entire economy becomes profits. It's not possible. So that's the first implication of this low nominal world. The profit growth will have, will have to converge to nominal GDP growth. 
Does that necessarily mean that it's a bad for stock market? I'm not sure. Because if low nominal growth is a structural phenomenon, then it also means that interest rates will have to stay down for a long period of time. So if you do a thought experiment, if you, somebody knows, if somebody tells you, if God tells us that interest rate will be zero forever, then your valuation for common stocks should asymptotically approach to infinity. Right? So if you go back to the second half of the 90s, we had a same kind of a situation where nominal growth around the world, because of the Asian crisis, have came down quite, quite dramatically. But at the same time, the U.S. real growth was, was fine. The U.S. real growth at the time was about 4.5%. Uh, but if you look at the U.S. corporate profit growth, it peaked out in 97, and that continued to drop until 2002. So you have a divergence between real growth and profit growth, and yet we had a mother of all equity bubble. Why? The interest rate came down. So I think probably if you think about, the, if you put all those things together, it looks to me the denominator, which is interest rates, when you're talking about valuation of common stocks, is way more important than what you have in denominator. Right? The denominator basically is your earnings, and denominator is your interest rate. If your interest rate going to zero, then you got an infinity. So I don't know. I'm just raising that issue for you to consider, for you to think through. But these are very interesting. So people ask me, Jim, why, why the hell we have such a low nominal growth? Well, the reason, I can give you a short answer, and I can give you a long answer. I think, you know, I'm going to give you a sort of somewhere in the middle. The short answer is, if you go around the world, I don't care which country you are talking about, China, United States, Europe, Japan, just name a country, every important economy in the world start to have a problem of savings far exceeding investment. In other words, every country has excessive saving problems. So it's a classic economics. You understand that. Anybody who learns from school the economics, you have the savings exceeding investment, then something has to take place in order to make the adjustment because savings has to equal investment. It's an identity. But if your savings exceeding your desired investment, then your output will have to fall or your price level will have to drop. That's exactly what is going on around the world because the savings rate have far exceeded the desired investment. That's the first one, that's a short answer. The medium, so a medium long answer is that if you think about the world, before 2008, the world worked perfectly. Why? Well, Americans, if you think about the world, at the time we always complain about the global imbalance, but if you think about the world, Asia, was the manufacturing center of the world. They had a high saving, lots of production. Americans basically are concentrating on consumption. So Asia basically launched this, launched this vendor financing model. You gave Americans excessive savings, allow them to borrow excessively, to, to lift, to increase spending consumption to a level that is far beyond their income, and then Asia can liquidate its excessive productive capacity. So actually it worked perfectly well. America, you can look at the American's current account deficit, deficit, it went through the roof. Asia's current account surplus, it went through the roof. The global imbalance kept the global economy in balance. One is I am, the other one is in balance. It's very philosophical when you think about it. But 2008, that model changed. Right now we have zero rates. The American consumers simply refuse to borrow. So if you don't borrow to finance your spending, then your spending will be confined by, by your income. And in the United States, 
the natural rate of income growth is about a 2%. Why? Well, you basically have 0.5% of the labor force plus 1.5% labor productivity. That's why right now, if you look at U.S. consumption growth, it's about 2 percent Where in the 90s, it was 4.5%. So if, if the demand side is shrinking, the supply side will have to downsize. That's exactly what happened across Asia. You can, say, you can see the goods prices are falling. You can see a lot of countries got into deflation. That's the long answer. But anyway, this is my first observation. We're dealing with very low nominal growth. We're dealing with... Um, we're dealing with a world where there's excessive supply, there's excessive savings. That is the, one of the big problems going forward. Number two, I want to make another comment, which regards the Fed policy. It's a hot topic. Everybody has to talk about it. So I have to talk about the hot topic. So the Fed policy. I was one of the early ones that basically said that there's no way that the Fed should raise rate. There would be no way the Fed will raise rate. And it turned out that the Fed has not raised rate. And I'm here standing here predicting the following. Well, everybody was basically still debating when and by how much the Fed will raise rate next year. I think we're probably going to end up with another round of policy stimulation. Don't know whether it's a QE4, but I think the Fed is going to have to take some actions in order to prevent price decline. Why am I saying that? Well, I have to look at my time. I don't want to overspend my time. Um, if you think about um, monetary policy today, we all understand one thing, that interest rates have already become zero. The meaning of monetary policy is totally different from the past. In the past, monetary policy is always regenerative in nature. Let me tell you why, what do I mean by regenerative. In old days where you still had interest rates, monetary policy can regenerate demand. Why? Well, you drop interest rates, you discourage savings, you encourage spending. That's why monetary policy worked. But once the rates become zero, monetary policy still work, but the nature of that working is different. In zero rate environment, monetary policy become redistributive in nature. Somebody doesn't like it, but anyway, I'm going to say it anyway. So why it's, it's, why it's redistributive in nature? Well, monetary policy can still make a difference, but it has to through the foreign exchange rate. In other words, a country A launch a QE. The, the consequence of that is basically a drive-down exchange rate, and any country got a cheaper exchange rate, you can take growth from somebody else, but in aggregate terms around the world, there's no net increase in demand. You just redistribute demand among nations, okay? So if you look at the U.S., we, if you look at the U.S., the dollar has gained 32% since two, it's pretty much 2013, okay? Sorry. Interesting part here is interesting point. If you look at the U.S. dollar, the U.S. dollar gained about 32% since 2013. That's two-thirds of the strength as the dollar did in the second half of the 90s. But the U.S. economy today is growing at a speed that is even less than half of what it did 20 years ago. That's one, you know, in the 90s, the U.S. economy was growing at 4.5% today. It's not even 2%. But the dollar gained 30-some percent. So the dollar has already done the tightening. So don't tell me that the U.S. monetary policy hasn't tightened. The U.S. monetary policy, 
the monetary standard, monetary stance has already been tightened. There is a basic rule of thumb I want everybody to remember. It's called 10 to 1. What does that mean? Well, for every 10% move in foreign exchange rate, you can translate that move into 100 basis point increase in interest rates. So if you think about the U.S. economy has basically done 30 some percent increase in real trade weighted terms, you basically have already tightened monetary policy by 300 basis point. That's why if you look at the curve here, this one, if you look at the, the blue line here, is the Eurozone. You can see the Eurozone is, is, is gaining some strength. The U.S., the, that's the bottom U.S. retail sale, you know, it's, it's losing some momentum. Look at the exports. U.S. exporters is right now contracting, whereas Japan is still expanding. That's all redistribution. And basically, it tells you there's net net basis. There's no aggregate demand increase, but you know, you just redistribute around growth. So the dollar basically has has given away. The dollar's appreciation basically has subsidized the rest of the world. I think we're at a point where you can no longer absorb additional increase in the U.S. dollar. That's why I think the direct implication from here is probably, I'm just using the probability, or I'm probably the dollar already peaked out back in March. 105, that could be the highs against the euro, and probably 125, that was the high against the yen. Of course, right now, the ECB is trying to stimulate again, probably going to push down the euro to back to the old, old lows, but I think the U.S. economy has probably exhausted its potential to absorb additional increase in the U.S. dollar, especially if you look at the U.S. corporate profits, it's already, already treading water. If that is the case, I think the next variable to weaken could be wages because, I mean, no company that continue to hire people if you don't have profit growth. So you have to basically have profit growth in order to generate jobs, in order to generate profits, in order to generate investment. I think that is the critical variable. That's why I keep telling people, do not confuse low interest rates with easy money. The monetary policy in the U.S., the money in the U.S. is not that easy because if you look at profits, it tells you that, okay? That's the second point I have to quicken a little bit. The third one is China. So today you cannot give a macro talk without mentioning China. You know, comparing to what I did 23 years ago, I was only a few guys actually covered China. Right now, everybody is a China expert. I respect that, but I'm going to give you my take. So you probably heard all the Chinese story, you know, the Chinese economy is oversaved, overleveraged, overinvested. You know, they have to change. Otherwise, the Chinese economy is going to toast, essentially. I have some sympathy to that view, but I think it's pretty much wrong. Okay? Why it is wrong? Well, the Chinese, in my view, which could be wrong too, but in my view, the Chinese economic problem primarily is caused by a set of bad economic policy. Why? Let me give you some numbers. You know exactly what I'm talking about. If you look at the Chinese monetary policy today, we know that they have cut rates by six times. But you have also to notice that the real borrowing costs in China today, if you want to borrow from banks, you are paying 10% in real terms. In other, words, in other words, the real borrowing cost in China is still at 10%. That is nonsense. Your economy is expanding at 7%. Your real borrowing cost is 10. Of course you're going to have a problem. That's monetary policy. Now, if you look at foreign exchange rate policy, the Chinese, Chinese currency has gone up 30-some percent along with the U.S. dollar. Because if we're packed to the dollar, 
Not only that, but before the recent surge in the U.S. dollar, the Chinese currency, renminbi, was appreciating against the dollar. So if you look at the real term, you measure, if you measure the total real appreciation in the Chinese yuan, has gone up 40%. It's the most expensive currency in the whole world. You probably noticed that all the Chinese are flocking around the world anywhere you can see, oh, there's a Chinese, oh, there's a Chinese. Because the Chinese are finding things are cheap. They are, they are going to Japan at a rate of four million per month. Even though, you know, the, the China, Japan, they don't get along, but the Chinese are going to Japan like crazy because they find things in Japan are so cheap, it's not even funny. So that's what I'm saying. Revealed preference is telling you that yen is very cheap. Don't want to bet yen keep going down. I think we're at a bottom. And don't, I think the Chinese currency is very expensive. They are basically telling you that the consumers are spending outside China instead of investing inside China. So that's foreign exchange rate policy. Now, if you look at a physical policy, do you know that even three months ago, we were talking about economic slowdown, but the Chinese central government's physical balance was 1.5% in surplus. So in other words, the physical policy is tightening. So you have a combination of very restrictive monetary policy, very expensive foreign exchange rate policy, and very restrictive physical policy. If you put them together, of course the Chinese economy have a problem. Of course they have deflation. Of course they have a slowdown. Now, the question is why they have taken such a bad policy combination? Well, to a large degree, that has to do with the bad advice that are given to them by us, the foreign strategist. Why? We keep telling them, you cannot, you cannot expand your credit too much. Look at your debt to GDP ratio. It's already at, at very high levels. If you keep doing that, you're going to have a systemic risk. That is a, such a bad advice. It's not even funny. I don't want to get started, but I, you know, I have to start uh, uh, you know, uh, saying something here. Why is it such a bad, bad advice? Very simple. The Chinese economy is a high savings economy, about a 50% of savings rate. So every year, the Chinese economy saves five, more than $5 trillion of, of national income. In other words, every year, you have to convert $5 trillion US dollars of national income into investment. How do you do that? There's no other way. You have to use banks. I mean, in the U.S., you can do that through the equity market, but because the U.S. equity market is so, so vast, so liquid, so deep, you can do that. But in China, and for that matter, Europe, Japan, same story. You cannot convert that savings through the equity market. You have to do that through the borrowing market. That's why if you look around the world, any country has the high savings rate. Their debt ratio is all high. You know which country has the highest debt GDP ratio? I'm talking about private sector. Singapore. Why I gotta say high savings? You know which one is the second highest? Korea. So if you lay them up, it's all country got a high savings rate, they all got a high debt. So that's why it's a, such a bad and superficial argument. If people telling you that this country got a high level of debt, it is accounting concept. It's not, it, you just pointed out a counting observation. It's not economic, it's not economic, it's not a fundamental. Think about Japan. The Japanese debt ratio just keep going up, 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 up. Never had a crisis, why? It's very simple. The private sector save a lot of money, they don't spend. So the government has, has to go in and borrow from private sector and spend for private sector. That's why you have a pile up, a continuation of a build up of the government sector debt. For the economy as a whole, it's perfectly imbalanced, no problem. I bet with anybody that Japan is going to have a debt crisis. It's crazy. So that's why I think they, they, <clears throat> they bought this bad idea. They implemented it. 
And as a result, you can, you can, you can, you can imagine such a high savings cannot be converted into this investment because they are taking a very restrictive monetary policy, trying to control credit creation, and then you got a massive problem of savings far greater than investment. As a result, the price level has to fall. That's why if you look at Chinese X factory, prices are dropping at a 3.5% a year for, for a long period of time. It's a classic signal of excessive savings, bad economic policy. Now, the good news is they are forced to abandon that stupid policy. You can see that they're cutting rates, they are beefing up, they are increasing physical st stimulus. That's the good news. The bad news is they are still behind the curve. They have to do more. They have to basically drop real borrowing costs to a level that is going to be stimulative for an economy that is growing at 6 and 7% in real terms, which means that the loan rate, the bank loan rate, has to be something like 2 to 3%. So I will stop right here. Uh, I stop my renting. And now it's floor is open. If you have any frustration, anger, so, you know, let me know. Or let's talk about it. Yep. Very interesting presentation as usual. Um, one thing I noticed is, you know, when I talk about Manchester United, I always say we, because I'm a big supporter. And when you talked about China at some point, you actually said we. So, do you see you? Obviously, you're Chinese, right? Um, but so yeah, do you see be. it? <laughs> yeah. So do you see it from their point of view or as a neutral observer? Because you I, said I, we. I, I said, why don't we talk about it? We, we. I sort of take myself as a third-party observer. Uh, we, we told them that they should credit, that they should control credit. I mean, we, that means that, you know, strategist, you know. Okay. I, I consider myself as a strategist. I never give them bad advice, but you know, most of strategists give them bad advice. So, yeah. Yeah, please. Uh, yeah, I wondered what your view was on the fear expressed uh, by the IMF, but also within financial markets, about the possibility of liquidity drying up. I mean, do you see that as a possibility? And if so, what kind of implications does it have? Um, that's more of a market technical problem uh, in terms of liquidity being drying up. Uh, it's whenever you have a shakeout, then you know you got more seller than buyer. That's always the problem. But in terms of in terms of uh, general monetary policy, I think the ECB is doing the right thing. I think Bank of Japan is doing the right thing. I think Bank of China, uh, the People's Bank of China, is doing the right thing. Uh, the only th the only thing that that Janet Yellen was almost done wrong was to raise rates. And thank God he, she didn't do it. I think if she raised the rate last time, it would go down as a major policy mistake. So I would not consider that as a policy consequence. I would consider that, you know, liquidity is always a problem when you talk about market liquidity. When there's, you know, when there's a shakeout, and people want to sort of get out of one asset class. But I would not sort of generalize and lump that into a problem caused by monetary policy. Do you have any salient comment on Switzerland, the Swiss franc, and the Swiss economy? <laughs> um, <clears throat> expensive. <laughs> it's so expensive, it's not even funny. Uh, especially, I come from Canada. Our dollar becomes uh, some sort of peso. So, <laughs> um, the Canadian peso, but whatever, sorry. Um, I think there's a lot of uh, premium in your assets, uh, especially the S Swiss franc and your bond market, uh, you, you basically, there's a euro breakup risk premium that actually being priced into the market. That's why you got all negative uh, bond yields. You know, that's what I'm wondering too. Why the hell the Swiss people, you guys can get infinite rich, infinitely rich by just issuing bonds. 
right? So people are paying to hold your bonds. Why don't you just go out and issue infinite amount of money? I mean, everybody should be given a million uh, uh, Swiss franc. And then, you know, every citizen, you know, breathing in this land should have a million, a million uh, Swiss, Swiss franc by issuing bonds. You got zero cost. Not zero cost. You got negative costs. It's a weird system. I don't know. I think this is completely weird. And when you think about it, it's spooky too. <laughs> okay. Yeah, the lady behind was first. How do you see the way that the China is handling the sales of U.S. Treasuries, and how can this impact the U.S. Treasury bonds? Because yeah. I mean, it's a big flow to address the Chinese outflow. So how do you see this going forward? Well, this is a uh, very good question. Um, there, there, are, there are multi part to that question. First of all, I think they handled it very badly in terms of financial ref reform. They made a big mistake by misjudging the situation. You remember in June, July, they wanted to liberalize uh, the forex market, but they did not anticipate that the selling pressure was so intense. So once they opened up, the currency dropped 2%, they were scared. So they said, holy mackerel, you know, if I completely open it up, the currency gonna, gonna dive. So they backed away. That was a big mistake. If you open up, open it up. If you liberalize, liberalize. Since they only did a little 2%, they backed off. The market expectation today is, the currency is either stay flat or going down. So every person in China is trying to convert the currency into US dollar. That's why that's a classic example of if you want to control prices, you have to compromise on your reserves. That's why they start to run down the reserves. If had they let the currency go, go down, just for argument's sake, 10, 15%, today's Today's question is whether you want to buy a Chinese RMB or not, right? So it's the same thing. Last decade, they just pressed, pressing down the currency. That's why they had a huge accumulation of reserve. This time around, they want to hold it up. Then you have a decline in reserve. So it's a stupid, bad policy. Like I used to see too much, sorry, but you know, it's a bad policy. In terms of impact on um, bond market, I don't see any, I and mean, the bond yields keep drifting lower. You know, the, the Chinese reserve is down about six, five, six hundred billion dollars, and bond yields, the U.S. keep drifting, drifting downwards. So I mean, say, well, you know, if they didn't sell properly, the bond yields are going to be even lower. I, I don't know how to, how to, how to uh, quantify that, but I, I don't see there's a significant impact. Don't forget that the decline in the Chinese um, reserve is also a reflection of uh, the fact that there's a revaluation effect because part of their reserve is held in euro, and when euro came down, you know, the valuation effect will also uh, kick in. So I don't, I'm, you know, in, sh in short answer, no, I don't see any impact at all. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, Thank this you. was a really great presentation and insight uh, to China and your beliefs. Uh, so are you staying for lunch so that uh, one can ask you questions during the lunch? I think I, think I can, but, but I think Mishka got a question. Okay, okay. The last one. That's my friend, so I have to... Okay, sure. <laughs> <laughs> a quick question concerning uh, multiples on equities. You hinted earlier that at zero interest rates they could go to infinity right. but you know if you go into your historical toolbox what would seem appropriate for the current environment I mean do, do you have some historical periods or comparable who say you know what you know I, I a, a mean, multiple of 20 would seem reasonable I mean this is a very it's an excellent question, but it's impossible, me, impossible for me to answer. Actually, I look into that exactly. Sort of an equal, equilibrium P ratio in zero rate environment. We had two examples in recent history. One is Japan. But the Japanese experiment 
was biased because the starting point is that the Japanese P ratio was 100 something. And then it took like a couple of decades to unwind that excessive valuation. And right now we're, we're at a par and probably even slightly lower than the US. So that is not a, that's no goal because you know, we did not have that starting point. The other ex example is really Switzerland. You know, you got a basically uh, mild deflation, zero inflation for about the last, last 20, 15 years. Tell me if I'm wrong. I think that's probably more or less the case. An extraordinarily low uh, interest rates. But the Swiss, the Swiss number is, you know, you probably know better than me, so if you average out, it's about 14 times. But there is a problem here, too, because your market is so biased towards financial. So it's not really a diversified market. So, you know, these are two ex 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 experiments that are as close to uh, the environment we're describing. So I give you a good story, but I don't have the answer. Sorry. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I, I really, you know, I think these are two examples that I can find in recent history. But maybe, you know, now I left the BCA, so I don't have that uh, access to the data. Maybe what we should do is to go back to the uh, gold standard. When, you know, if you look at the gold standard, 60% of the time, the world economy was in mild deflation. And most of the time, when the world was in mild def deflation, stock prices tend to go up. When, only when the deflation becomes greater than minus three or four percent, we start to have a problem. But you know, like minus one or minus one and a half percent price decline, stock prices tend to go up. Maybe that is a uh, that is something I could look at, look into. Right. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed for the great uh, presentation. And thanks a lot. <laughs>